Good morning, Winterberry Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay. Well, we will be on like now. So there we go. This is really exciting because not only are we live in person, but we're live, 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 live. So <laughs> really, it's live, 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 live. So on our website right now, we're streaming and on Facebook and YouTube. So I just thank you. Uh, thank the Lord for all the volunteers that are, that are making this happen and making that happen as well. So, I'm excited. Yeah, there we go. We should have that. There's a praise. Thank you, Lord, for that. Um, I'm glad that you're here, and I hope that you're feeling well. We had our check-in this morning, and as part of that check-in, there was a list of things. And we wanted to really consider the body, consider each other, and making sure that we're healthy. And so as part of that, uh, you're out here feeling well, and if you're not feeling well, then you're enjoying live, uh, the live stream back at your homes. Uh, if you have to use the restroom, I wanted to point out that you just go through the doors, through the great room, there are signs uh, leading to the restroom, and um, somebody will be in there, and they'll take a temperature check. Again, this is for safety, and we're following our guidelines. They'll just do a simple click over there, they'll check your temperature, and uh, hoping everybody will be well. Uh, we've had a few changes that I wanted you to be aware of on our website. Website has been, it's a new website now, a little bit easier maybe to navigate around there. And uh, one of the things that we wanted you to be aware of is those important things on the homepage, like the live stream, like prayer. And then we also have our fall launch, and Emery's gonna be talking about that shortly. We have the Wintonberry app, and you know that you had the Winterberry app and it's up and running well if you received a notification this morning to tell you about live streaming. So if you don't have the Winterberry app, go to your local stores, <laughs> Google Store and uh, Apple Store, and then download that app. The other thing we're making you aware of, you probably saw that in Winterberry Weekend, which is our weekly communication, is that uh, this is an opportunity for you to receive text messages. So if you received a text message this morning that talked about the live stream, then you're set with that as well. We want to make sure that you're receiving all the communication possible so you know what's happening at Wintonberry. So we'd love for you to be able to check those things out. And now Amory's going to be telling us a little bit more about some important things at Wintonberry. So Amory. Yeah. Get my stand over here. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be together today on this beautiful, glorious, sunshiny fall day. It is fall today. It's crazy how we're already in September, and we're happy for the cars that are still coming in. And we're going to look forward to the day that the Lord will let us be back in our house, which shouldn't be much longer, but, you know, come prepared, you know, to worship, to be together, to talk with each other, to stay toasty and warm. But come, come to church. Whether you're here with us today or you're virtually with us um, online, thank you for being with us. We do pray that God would touch your heart today. Um, and we just want to speak about, there are a few announcements, so let me try to do the best I can. First off, if you're new to our church and this is one of your first times here, if you did not get this package, which is just a welcome package, please stop by that little table over there, grab one of these, let us know who you are and how you are. You can do the same thing virtually by getting online, as Dave said, and checking out winterberry.org. Just share with us if you've got prayer requests, and if you do, you can pop them right in that basket along with your offering. We are super happy that you're here today. So, announcement-wise, sorry, technology, there it is. Okay, so first off, what we want to remind you about is that we're still in this season of prayer. If you didn't get this prayer journal yet, we're just, we're just walking alongside of each other, praying together, seeking God together. We're doing that all of the month of September. These journals are available, and if you didn't get one of these, you're certainly welcome. I'm sorry, it's a devotional. You're welcome to grab one of those at the desk, and for those that are with us online today, you can download this at wintonberry.org. So stay with us in prayer through the month of September. Um, we know God speaks to us as we pray and seek him together. Uh, we've also got a season of 10 days of prayer that Wellspring Church is hosting. And this is a pretty significant thing. There's about 24 churches that are 
involved in praying daily. It started the 18th of September. Uh, it's going to go all the way through the 27th of September. Our main reason for coming together is to pray for the nation during this very difficult time. There's no question that there's a lot of things happening, and there's a lot of need for prayer. Wellspring has opened up its church parking lot, actually, similar to what we're doing, only with a large tent. They have 24-hour worship and prayer going on there for the next for all of these 10 days. So we're in the middle of it. Wintonberry is going to host. Many churches are hosting, but Wintonberry is going to host um, this coming Friday from 7 to 9, so please consider joining. Um, it's about prayer, well, worship, prayer, repentance, and then intercession. And so, uh, well, just a deeper bit of prayer, I should say. Um, there's a lot to pray for, as I said. We're grateful for uh, Wellspring's leadership in this manner. They've done this year after year. They're our sister church, and so, again, just encouraging you to join when you can. You have plenty of opportunity to do that over the next few days, and you can find more information on that if you need to through our church website. And then lastly, we're starting up fall at Wintonberry. As you drove in, sorry about that echo. As you drove in, you could have received a couple of flyers for those that are here and for those that are online. There's two main things that we're doing this season, and that's Wednesday Night Live along with life groups. Life groups, we're looking for you to register. Life groups this week, please, and join in. Life groups is the mainstay of our missions here at the church. You know, if you want to get together and be intimate with one another, you're going to want to do that in your life group. And we've got, I think I counted about 14. Many of the groups are, are meeting virtually. Um, we would love for you to join. Uh, and then when we can, once the restrictions are over, you know, we'll start to meet live. But at any rate, we, we, that's a significant ministry. We would love to see you all participate. So if you're in a group, please stay with your group. If you're not yet in a group, you can contact myself or David Blau. The list of group, the list you would have gotten as you came in, but basically it's sorted by day of the week, who's leading, uh, what kind of group it is, how often it meets, everything you need to know about life groups is there. So do engaged in that way. And then lastly, Wednesday Night Live is the second way we're really, you know, bringing back some things this fall. And, and you'll, you can also see from the list that it's going to meet you in different aspects of your faith journey. So if you're a new believer, David Blau and Roland Bernard has a, has a nice uh, class for beginners. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know this is long, I tell you. Rich Ainsworth, we love him. <laughs> He's going to teach a class in a deeper, uh, you know, definitely a deeper study on the Gospels. Uh, Pat Taylor is going to talk about emotional uh, healing, and even if you're struggling in this season, that would be a real blessing to you if you want to join her group. And then lastly, Andre and the elders will be speaking about the race conversation and continuing that from what we've done this summer. So that's everything that's happening in the fall. We know some leaders are in the house who are in this beautiful parking lot right now. So if you're a leader, we'd like to commission you for uh, your season of ministry. So if you're a leader, please stand up so that we can pray for you. And can we acknowledge the leaders of our church? Because we would not. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. We would not be able to do church without them. So. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gift of our leaders at Wintonberry. We just praise you, Lord, for every man and woman that seeks to serve you um, and seeks to bring your people along. Lord, we pray you would bless them this fall, into the winter, into the spring. We pray that you'd anoint whatever uh, their ministries are, Lord God. We thank you so much for these leaders, Lord. Um, we just love them, and we appreciate following them and their shepherding of us, Lord. And so we thank you and praise you. And we pray for uh, our church to remain unified, Lord Jesus, as we seek you in these days, Lord, and that you would use these good men and women to, to bring us to new places with you, Father God, in deeper relationship with you. Um, as we turn our eyes to you, Lord, through worship and prayer, we just pray, Jesus, that you'd open up our hearts to what you have for us today and that you would bless our time. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tour 
good God. And Father, we sing, Lord, because all that we are, all of our sustenance in life, everything, Father, comes from you, Lord. All of our fountains, Lord. Everything that overflows out of our life, Lord, we want to be rooted and sourced in you, God. And so this morning, through song, we encourage our hearts and our minds to align with who you are. And we sing that out and we declare it. We sing it over ourselves, we sing it over our families, we sing it over this church community, we sing it over our towns and our communities, we sing it over the state, we sing it over this nation, we sing it over this world, that you are good, and you are our king, and our source is in you. In Jesus' name, let's continue our worship. I was trying to land. I tell myself, keep walking on. You're something up ahead, a water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me home. Let it flow, let it flow.
Let's sing the chorus again. Open the heavens. Testament that we should always be ready for the reason why we look different. And so, Father, um, we want to be ready to tell that story, especially in the climate and temperature of this world. My prayer is that you would give us courage and empower us by your spirit, that when we're not acting like everyone else is acting, we're not speaking like everyone else is speaking, we're not thinking like everyone else is thinking. When we walk in peace and love and the fruit of your spirit, and people notice that and ask that we would be courageous and say, this is my story. May they come by the power of thy testimony and the blood of the Lamb. Blessed surely Jesus is my This is my story. This is my
you this morning father we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your grace we thank you for the redemption story which is now our story in Jesus Christ let us be bold and courageous to tell that story give us eyes to see the opportunity and to make it another person's story you are good father we worship you and you are worthy in Jesus name amen Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to ask my friend Anaya Smith to come forward and read our scripture for today. Psalm 32. Wow, what a beautiful morning. It is good for those of you who are home. Come on out. It's beautiful out here. You can use this mic right here. I'll move this for now. Oh. Okay, maybe I won't. <laughs> Blessed is the one whose way is also forgiven. The sin The Lord never counts against him. He doesn't want to cheat anyone. When I kept silent about my sin, my body became weak because I groaned all day. Day and night, your heavy hand punished me. Right. I became weaker and weaker as I do in the heat of summer. Then I, admitted, then I admitted my sin to you. I didn't cover up the wrong I had done. I said, I will admit my lawless acts to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let everyone who is godly pray to you while they can still look up to you. That when trouble comes like a flood, they certainly won't reach the, those who are godly. You are my hiding place. You keep me safe from trouble. By the, you will surround me with songs sent, sung by those who praise you, because you save your people. I will guide you and teach you the way you should go. I will give you good advice and watch over you. 
don't give us the horse or the mule. They can't understand anything. They have to be controlled by bits and bridles. If they aren't, they if they aren't, they won't come to you. Sin sinful people have all kinds of trouble, but the Lord's faithful love is all around those who trust Him. Be glad because of the of what the Lord has done for you. Be joyful, you who do what is right. Sing, sing all of those hearts on our all sing all of you whose you whose hearts are famished. As I get myself in place here, I just want to remind you, for those who may have come a little late, um, that if you take your cell phone out and you, you go to the Wintonberry app or on the website, those of you at home, if you go to Wintonberry, check on live stream. The slides are available for you there. Um, and so you'll be able to follow along. Actually, I think live stream, they're going to see them anyway, so you're okay. But those of you who are here, you might want to look at your phones as I go through this this morning. There's a story of the man and woman created by God who rebel against him. And you know what they do. They put fig leaves on them. And in doing that, they plunge the world into sin and darkness. And then there's a story of the ten brothers who have a younger bro they're jealous of, and they sell him into slavery. And when they come home, they give a, a falsely blood-tattered coat to their father. And they plunge that man into 20 years of depression and darkness. And then, of course, there's a story of the mighty king who, instead of going to war, follows his lust, ends up impregnating a woman, killing her husband and marrying her. Those three stories all have four things in common. The first thing is all those characters were favored by God. Secondly, they exchanged their favor for temporary pleasures. And then they tried, third, to cover up their misdeed. And the result was all four plunged into darkness. Which leads to our main point this morning. And that is that you just can't keep the cover on covered up sin. You can't keep the cover on covered up sin. It's going to come out. It's either going to explode or it's going to be exposed. One or the other. You can't keep the cover on covered up sin. And even though we all know that and you're saying, okay, Andre, obviously everyone knows that. We still do it, don't we? From U.S. presidents to regular Joes like you and I, we throw rugs over our muddy tracks. We know it doesn't work and yet we keep pretending when we get caught speeding, I didn't know the speed limit, officer. When we don't bring our homework to school, I, the dog ate it, right? I mean, we all know. And yet we keep doing this. We keep trying to cover over that which we can't cover over. And it's all the same. It's sin against God. It's sin against one another. And it hurts all of our relationships. So my question this morning is really pretty simple. Are you covering anything up? Is there any part of your life that is hidden from others or that you're trying to hide from God as if we could? Are you covering anything up? We're continuing our study of the Psalms today, Light in the Dark. We're in Psalm 32. Thank you for Anaya for reading for us this morning. And I've called it, obviously, covering. Because what we're going to see this morning is two different kinds of covering. We're going to see human covering and divine covering. And the two have drastically different consequences. Human covering and divine covering. You got to choose one or the other. My outline is pretty simple. If you're looking at Psalm 32 in front of you, the first two verses, David talks about the blessedness of being covered by God. Verses 3 to 5, 
the misery of when humans try to cover our own sin. And then six to the end is, is defenses that we can employ so that we don't get in the position of having to cover up in the first place. So let's start then with verses 1 and 2 and the, the wonder of God covering our messes. Verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. I love blessed assurance. Oh, I love singing that this morning. Blessed is the one. The Hebrew literally is happy. Happy. Happy is the one who, who finds their sins taken care of by God and right with God. And he describes what this is like. In these two verses with with two parallel threesomes. The first one are the three most common words for for wrongdoing in the Old Testament. The first one there, transgressions in my translation. Uh, And and this word is the word pesha. And pesha means to to go away from something, to depart from something. So this has in its idea that God removes, he takes away our sin from us. Whether it's rebellion it's wrongdoing in its core. It's rebellion against authority. That's what this wrongdoing is. And we need God to take that away. We can't do it. So it's, it's getting away from It's leaving. It's departing. Instead of staying on the way of God, we depart from the way of God. It's rebellion. That's what that patient means. Departing from the way of God. Rebellion. The second word, my translation says sins. In the end of verse 1, some of you said just say sin. The word is chata. And chata means coming up short. You've probably heard that before. It's like an archer, right? Psst, and he comes up short of the target. That's shatah. So it means falling short of God's perfect standard. So sin is a departure away, and it's a falling short of the departure. And then finally in verse 2, he says, the one who's sin, sin, and my, the word there is hawan. Some of your translations read iniquity. And that word means crooked. Literally, it's the word crooked, and it means corrupt, right? We think of corrupt people. That's a wand. It's something that's warped and bent, and that speaks to our human nature. Our human nature, since Adam and Eve, is corrupt. It's bent. We have a natural imperfection which, which lends itself to hiding, to covering up, to stealing, to raging, to lusting, to bitterness. Look, there's a theological term for this. It's called depravity. Maybe you've heard of this. Total depravity. Depravity. Think about a, a, a glass of chocolate milk, right? I like chocolate milk. Chocolate milk's yummy. But put some mud in it. It doesn't look any different, but do you want to drink it now? Now with mud in it. Now there's still a lot of good chocolate milk in there. It's not as if every molecule is now dirt. It's not. But there's a compromise that's happened. Do you see that? So total depravity, when the theologian says that, they don't mean that human beings can't do anything good. We still have the image of God. We can still do good, and people do. But everything's tainted. It's tainted. Relationally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, we're tainted. Like mud and chocolate milk. And it needs to be redeemed. It needs to be be cleaned out. And that's where the next three words in these two verses balance these three words for sin. They're the three words for forgiveness. And the first one, you're blessed as one of transgressions are forgiven. Forgiven. This word nasa. Nasa is similar to that pesha word for sin. It's, it's to carry off. It's to take away. Think of the scapegoat. Right? That's pasha. So God forgives. He takes this sin that we've committed. And he, he removes it from us. Happy is the one who does that. Then the second one is where we're getting our theme from, right? Whose sins are covered. Kasha. Kasha. Kasha means to conceal something. It means to cover. But this is God covering And this would speak to, for the Jews, the Day of Atonement, which is coming up at the end of these 10 days. We're in the middle of 10 days of awe, it's called in Judaism, from Rosh Hashanah this past Friday, all the way to next week from Monday. 10 days of repentance in Judaism, leading up to Yom Kippur, atonement. Nasa, or Kasha, I'm sorry, Kasha. What happens on Kasha? God covers over our sin. He atones for it. And then finally, this third one in verse 2, that whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Count is a financial term, yasab. And yasab is is, is an accounting term. It means he doesn't put it on our ledger. He clears our ledger. So I may 
when we sin, we owe God a great debt. And what God does with Yisav is he clears the debt. He clears it out. We're not bankrupt before God any longer. So what we see in these six words is, a, is really a summary of the gospel, isn't it? The three sin, words for sin basically tell us that sin is really bad. Sin's a big deal. But the three words for forgiveness tell us that God's bigger. He's bigger. And he can cover all of this. And he can forgive. And I don't know where you're at this morning or if you're listening from home. But wherever you are, no matter what you've committed, according to this, God can cover it. But then there's one, but who's it for? Look at the end of verse 2 because it could cause a little bit of concern. He says, blessed are the one who God, okay, he's going to forgive everybody? Well, look at the very end. In whose spirit is no deceit. Whoa, what do you mean? Someone who's totally pure? No, no, you know, nothing, no false motive, totally sincere. Is anyone completely sincere at any time? I mean, we're tainted people. Wait a minute, what do you mean? One in whom there is no deceit. What is this getting at? Do you have to be perfect to be forgiven? No. Actually, Paul himself quotes these two verses, 30, Psalm 32, 1 and 2, in the book of Romans. He says this. He says, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So instead of our counter, you know, our debt being just wiped out, more than that, God imputes, the theological word is, he and some of your translations actually use that word, he imputes, he, he credits to our account all of his right. So we go from owing a huge debt to actually having all the riches of heaven at our disposal. It's astounding. And it's for those who have no deceit. And he describes this. Look what Paul says again. He says, David says the same thing when he speaks. Now this is Paul interpreting these verses. Paul says when David speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from their works. Do you hear what he said? Then he goes ahead and quotes these two verses in Romans. So Paul's telling us these verses are not for perfect people. To have no deceit basically means it's for the person who's honest and is willing to be honest before God, take the cover off their sin, be honest about who they are, and say, I know I can't be right with you by anything I do. I can only be right with you by being honest with you so that you can cover it all. That's what it means to have no deceit. I like how the NET Bible puts it in their footnote. Look at this. The point is not that the individual is sinless and pure. No, no, no. In this context, which focuses on confession and forgiveness of sin, the psalmist refers to the one who refuses to deny or hide his sin, but instead honestly confesses it to God. Do you hear that? The one who's made righteous with God isn't the one who's got it all together. No, no, no. It's the person who has been honest and say, I don't have it all together. That's all it takes. The key then is not being perfect, but being honest, which is exactly what David says in another psalm, psalm which we looked at a few months ago, Psalm 51, where he says, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, not a perfect spirit, a broken spirit. Do you have a broken spirit here this morning, church? Now, Psalm 51 is interesting. Because David wrote it when he had come clean from his awful sins that he had tried to cover up. You know the story. The king is, should be out into battle with his men. Instead, he stays behind in the city. And he's walking on his palace rooftop. And he looks down. He sees a gorgeous woman named Bathsheba who's bathing nude. And his lust takes over him. He sends for her. At least in my opinion, takes advantage of her. And then at that point, he figures he got away with it. This week, I was reading in Job. Listen to this verse of Job. The, key, the eye of the adulterer watches for dusk. He thinks, no, one, no eye will see me, and he keeps his face concealed. That's interesting. David thought he could get away with his sin under the cover of night. He hid it. He thought he could cover up just like we do. But what did I say earlier? You can't keep the cover on covered up sin. You can't. No matter what you do. We lie. We try to. We wait for nighttime when everyone's asleep. It doesn't work, does it? 
It gnaws at us. So my question again, are you covering anything up this morning? Are you hiding anything from God, from your spouse, from your parents? Are you hiding? Well, a few weeks later, David gets some bad news, doesn't he? Guess what? That little one-night stand? She's pregnant. Oh, no. Now what? He comes up with a new cover-up. I know. Let's call her husband Uriah back from the front lines. Surely he'll lie with her and they'll all think it's it's his baby. Only problem is Uriah has integrity. And he refuses to lie with his wife when he comes back while his, his brothers are out fighting and, and suffering. So now what? Need another cover-up. See, this is the problem with cover-ups, right? They lead from one to another to another. He says, you know what? Put your eye in the front lines. And don't worry if he's killed. Sure enough, he's killed. Ah, now he got away with it, right? He's dead. They wait the time, a couple weeks for a morning, the day of period of mourning. When it's over, he marries Bathsheba immediately. Several months later, has the baby. No one thinks the better of it. He got away with it. Crisis averted. Sin covered up. But with all that in mind, read verses 3 and 4. When I kept silent, David said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy on me my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer have you ever felt that heaviness when you've been hiding something david literally is physically affected by this and we know we've got all kinds of research that shows that when bitterness is not is not uh, given over to God, confessed, how it, it has a physical effect on you. When, when we embrace sin, it has a physical impact on you. He is tortured. You know, covering up is sort of like an infection in your body. It might be hidden, can't see it. It might be invisible, but man, it is ready to explode at any moment. When my son was two years old, just about two, he got really sick. And we didn't know what was going on. We brought him to the hospital. And what they ended up finding is that he had a lemon-sized abscess in his, in his stomach that was, a, that was really pressurized and ready to go. And they said if it ruptured, it would have killed him. That's what hidden sin is like. It's like that abscess, that pressure-filled abscess inside of you. And if you don't, you don't surgically, and it's got, her surgery hurts. Confession hurts. It's embarrassing and humiliating. But man, does it beat the pain of explosion and destruction. And yet we try, don't we? We try to cover things up. You know, you're, someone's, you we're watching a questionable TV show and someone comes in and what do we do? Flip, flip the remote. Or whatever you're watching on your, on your phone, your tablet. I'll just flip it real quick. We do this all the time. We're always trying to protect ourselves. I was thinking how cover-ups are like an old pair of dirty, you know, dirty jeans that should be thrown out. They're comfortable and easy to put on, but they're dirty and full of holes. And it, but it's just plain natural to go into what you're used to, isn't it? As a matter of fact, it's genetic for us to slip into cover-ups. Remember Adam and Eve. What was their instinct when they disobeyed God? Cover-up. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, 9 and 10. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Is the Lord calling to you this morning? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You hiding? And the man answered, I heard you in the garden. Now listen carefully. And I was afraid, fear, because I was naked, guilt, shame, so I hid, isolation. What does covering up sin do for us? Produces fear, guilt, shame, and isolation. Does it with God, does it with each other. You know, husbands and wives, come on, we can get real here for a minute. 
or, or kids, when you're not honest with your parents, fear, guilt, shame, isolation. That's where it leads. You know, guilt says, I did something bad. Shame says, I am bad. And you go long enough without dealing with your sin, and your shame becomes your identity. You just convince there's nothing good in me. And then we have to manage our sin. So what do we do? Well, if we manage it, you know, it, we, we, we either self-judge ourselves and we implode with self-judgment and self-hatred, or we know ourselves with pleasure and work and addictions, trying to get away from this pressure. But no matter how much we try, we can't manage our sin. And sooner or later, it either explodes or it's exposed. It's one or the other if you try to cover it up. It's going to be, it's going to come out. You can't keep the cover on, covered up sin. You can't. Try. The pressure will be too great at some point. And here's the beautiful thing. God loves us way too much to leave us there. Way too much. As David said in verse 4, God's hand was heavy upon him. That's not because God's mean. It's because he's loving. He says he felt like water evaporating on a hot summer day. See, God will discipline us. He'll discipline us to get our attention. Not leave our conscience alone. It's out of love. So are you covering anything this morning? You don't need to. Are you covering anything this morning? David was covering up some nasty, nasty stuff. But God loved him so much, he allowed in public for a prophet to come before him and call him out. That was God's love. And in that moment, David had a couple, he had a decision to make. Think about that. Go back there. You're so familiar with the story. You don't put yourself in and think about it enough. Go back to the story. In that moment, you're David on the throne in public. You've just been humiliated by this prophet. No one questions King David. Think about his options right here. Put him to death. Attack your, acu your, your accuser. Or maybe deny it. No, you're mistaken. You know, or maybe just minimize it. Well, he had it coming to him. David chose a better way. He humbled himself in that moment. And he confessed. Verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I didn't cover up my iniquity. I said, I will. Three things here. Confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. There's three things he did here. Number one, acknowledge. He acknowledged. Acknowledge means to agree. Acknowledge means agree. All you're doing when you're acknowledging, you're agreeing. God, this is wrong. This is wrong. I'm not going to justify it. I'm not going to say, well, you know, she was so mean to me if you just understood. No, I'm not going to make any excuses. This was wrong. Acknowledge. Agree with God. Then he says, I didn't cover up. At that point, he didn't. He, he went ahead and... and and let everyone see the ugliness. And then the third thing he did, I will confess. He spoke it out. And when he did these three things, the Lord said, all right, let me think about forgiving you, and maybe I'll forgive you. Is that what your version says? And you forgave the guilt of my sin. No hesitation. That's our God. That's our God. Immediately. No waiting. Just like the prodigal father, when the prodigal son came home, the prodigal son is halfway into his confession. The father doesn't need the full confession. All he needs is the slightest turn towards him and poof, arms of love. The father's heart is for us. You are good. That's what we sang this morning. It's true. He's so gracious and eager to forgive. We just need to be honest. Stop being afraid. We all sin. It's, expose it. John puts it in very familiar verse. Many of you can quote with me. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, number one, and to purify us from all unrighteousness as if it never happened in the first place. All it means takes is honest confession. All we need to do is confess and God does the rest. But I don't know about you. When I confess, when I do something wrong and I confess, 
Are you like me? In that moment, I still kind of feel bad. And I still kind of want to beat myself up. And I still feel like I'm not worthy. And I still feel like, how can I just go serve God now or read the Bible or pray? What a hypocrite I am. I start thinking along those lines. But that's a total misunderstanding of God's forgiveness. See, once he forgives, it is gone. Gone. Cleansed. Because the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross overwhelms my sin. If I confess my sin to God in the name of Jesus, believing he died for my sin, then my sin is blown away. It has no chance in front of the perfections of the sacrifice of Christ. It's not taking advantage. That's a lie from Satan the accuser. That you've got to do some penance after you confess before God's going to like, no! It's not taking advantage of God's grace to sin and confess. It is glorifying to God to rightly believe that Jesus' sacrifice overwhelms your sin. Don't wait to confess. Don't wait till you think you're worthy to confess. Confess! Now, back to Psalm 51 for a minute. In that Psalm, David says, Lord, I will teach transgressors your way. You've forgiven me from this massive, these massive sins. I will now teach others your way. And he keeps his promise with Psalm 32. Psalm 32 is David keeping his promise from Psalm 51. He's now going to teach us the way of righteousness so that we don't ever have to cover up sin in the first place. And that's where the rest of the psalm goes, starting in verse 6. He says, Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. David encourages prayer. The first defense against having to cover up in the first place is being prayerful. Obviously, we talk about this all the time. Anne Marie mentioned in the, in, in the announcements, we talk about prayer. That's why we're doing the 31 days of prayer right now, staying close to the Lord. And then he says, while you may be found, I think there's different opinions there. My opinion there is that what he's talking about is, 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 is keep your relationship good with God so you never even get to the point where you have to cover anything up. Because if, you, if you're good with God, then when the mighty waters come, they're not going to tempt you. They're not going to take you away because you're close to God. The problem is we're easily distracted people in this digital age, aren't we? There's so many things. Even this morning, you chose to be here. You're listening to this. There's so many other options. So it's easy to neglect prayer. And that's why we did the 31 days. We want to encourage us to stay close to God. That's why the 10 days of prayer wellspring are so important. It's an opportunity to get together with people from other churches and together corporately to repent. We need to repent. This nation's a mess. And before we point fingers at everyone else, let's start with us, the church. And so this is a chance for us over 10 days to repent and seek the Lord and, and, uh, and, and cry out for revival. We need revival. And it starts with us. So again, it's 24 hours a day, nonstop, praying. Words. Any, if you're awake in the middle of the night, drive over to Wellspring. There'll be somebody there. Anytime in the next, from now till a week from Monday, go seek the Lord. Then in verse 7, we get two more defenses against needing to cover up in the first place. David says, Lord, you are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. You are my hiding place right now, present tense. Right now, you are my hiding place. I, I, I have myself grounded in you. I'm aware of your presence. And he says, and, I, and so you surround me with songs of deliverance. The Lord sings over him. He sings to the Lord. There's this life of worship, prayer and worship. And he stays close to the Lord, God's presence. So prayer, presence, praise. It's these things that keep us connected to him. And think about it. Every time we sin, whether it's screaming at someone in rage and anger, whether it's uh, un not forgiving someone, hating somebody, every time we sin, it's a denial of the presence of God. And it's a denial that God's good. So practicing God's presence and, and a life of praise mitigates against those things. Practicing his presence reminds me, I, I, God's in my presence when I'm with Leah, when I'm with Steve. This is holy ground. I, I won't think that way, and I'll just respond to them in, in my human flesh if I'm not practicing his presence. You're my hiding place. I'm hitting you right now. And praise reminds me God is good. 
instead of being tempted to react adversely to, 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 to difficult circumstances. So we've got prayer, he says. Immerse yourself in prayer in the presence of the Lord and praise. And then in verses 8 and 9, he has one other one. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, bridle, or they will not come to you. These two verses together are talking about a teachable heart. Do we have teachable hearts this morning? Are we correctable? When's the last time someone rebuked you? Now, there's, this, there's differences in the commentators about verse 8. Is it talking about God instructing us? That's how we typically quote it. Verse 8 is a well-quoted verse. But most commentators believe it's not God, it's David. David's keeping his promise from Psalm 51. He's instructing the congregation. It's a congregational psalm. He's saying, I've learned from the Lord, and now I'm going to teach you the way that he showed me to go. Follow me as a forgiven one into forgiveness. So that's how I'm interpreting it. But what's going on here is this teachability. Teachability. Don't be like a horse or a mule, right? Horses. They, they easily run away. They're tempted. Their natural instinct is to run away. Mules, natural instinct is to stubbornly refuse to move, right? And that's how we deal with sin. We either run away when we sin or we deny it. Say, no, don't be like that. Be teachable. Be teachable. So, so here's a practical thing. Just think about this for a minute. When's the last time that you can remember consciously saying to the Lord, Father, I've sinned against you. Please forgive me for this. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time that you asked forgiveness from another person? You. Don't think about anybody else. Think about you. When's the last time you went to someone and said, I sinned against you. I did this. Would you please forgive me? When's the last time you did that? If it's been a while, then I need to come worship in your sphere. When's the last time someone rebuked you? Maybe people have found that you're not very correctable. That you always have a, a defense against whatever anyone brings up, and so they've stopped correcting you. Do you have a teachable heart? That's what these questions are getting at. Do I have a teachable heart? Or have I gotten to a very complacent place and think, I'm all set. You are setting yourself up to be bitten bridled by God, bitten bridled by God, if you don't have a teachable heart, because he doesn't go for that. And he loves you too much to leave you there. Be prepared. And then finally, verse 10, he gives us a fifth defense so that we don't even go there. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Humble yourself, right? The wicked are those who refuse to be corrected. They refuse to confess. They keep fighting against God and others, and it says they're just going to accumulate woes and sorrows. But the righteous, those who admit their fault and needs, not the perfect ones, we made that point earlier, it's the ones who are honest, without deceit, Right? They will experience the reassurance of what? God's unfailing love. Chesed, that beautiful Hebrew word. Chesed. Unfailing love. Unconditional love. That's just ready to be poured out on you. That's what comes to those who are honest. That's who the righteous are. And I know about you, when I blow it, and I do, when I blow it, the verse that when I go to say, oh God, forgive me, I can't believe I just did that, said that, thought that. The verse that, that just helps me to remember that his love is still with me, I don't know about you, is Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That's chesed. My God. Thank you for your faithfulness in the face of my unfaithfulness. Praise be to God. He's our hope. And then David closes this all out with a note of celebration in light of this forgiveness. He says, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. Three imperatives, three commands. Rejoice, be glad, sing. And all three of those words are strong expressions. They are not softies. This is some serious this is not casual, stoic worship. 
These are people who understand the depth. David understands the depth to which he's been forgiven. And he can't help but express it in exploding praise and worship. Praise you, God. Think about David for a minute. Adultery. Gone. Murder. Gone. Lying. Gone. Heavy conscience. Gone. Gone. And he celebrates clean forever. So let me ask you one last time. Are you hiding anything? Are you covering up anything? Kids. Spouses. There's no need to. No need to cover up any longer. There's no need. Nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Let me close with three things we, that we ought to be doing. Three things we can do. Let me, I don't like to say ought. That sounds like legalism. Number one, we need to let God examine us. Actually, say these words with me. Examine, confess, claim. Examine, confess, claim. Give God an opportunity. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That takes time. Carve out some time. First thing in the morning. Don't rush into your day in your own human strength. Lord, examine me. Search me. Is there anything offensive? Is there anything that's causing fear in me? Isolation. Just pause when you're feeling. Give him a chance to examine you in the silence. Let him speak to you. We need that. Because we can't examine our own selves. We think too highly of ourselves, most of us. Or, or we beat ourselves up too much. We don't have an objective view. Let God examine you. Let the Holy Spirit examine you, number one. If he shows you anything, confess it right there. Don't, you don't have to be good enough to confess. Confess it right there. And actually, Scripture tells us in James 5, 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I hope you have an accountability partner. I do. Someone I confess my sin to. He prays for me and I pray for him. We need accountability. We, that's for help. We need to confess to one. There's no reason to cover it up. We're all sinners. Examine, confess, and then claim. Claim towards total forgiveness. Because when, and that, and when you do that, your identity begins to change. And you stop seeing yourself as shamed. You start seeing yourself as beloved. You start to understand, my goodness, I'm cleansed. That's how great Christ's sacrifice was. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. And when you begin to claim that, then you can walk in freedom. But until you walk in freedom, you're going to continue to walk in this kind of a way. Fearful, shameful, guilt. No, no, no. God wants you to be free. And it begins with confession. It begins with getting honest. So I'm about to pray right now, and it'd be really easy to just say, amen, and then let's talk about the Patriots. Or cooking, or whatever you're into, okay? Don't miss this moment. If you've been covering something up, there's a lot of people who would love to pray with you and love on you. Why wait? So let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we are so grateful for Jesus. Oh, thank you that you sent your perfect son to offer a perfect sacrifice in our place that we might be free from shame and guilt, free to worship you. Lord, help us to simply be honest before you. Help us to be willing to take the cover off. Even in this moment, if there's anyone here who needs to uncover, we pray that they would hear your word saying, don't be afraid. Come to me. Lord, help us to take you seriously. Because you have so many blessings to pour into us if we do. 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Thank you, Lord. Blessed Jesus for forgiving our sins. Help us to walk uncovered before you and others by faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to close and just say the Lord's Prayer together as a closing to honor the Lord. We're going to say transgressions. Repeat after me. Or not repeat, I'm sorry. With all together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bless all of you at home. Bless all of you here. Don't be afraid to uncover. Amen.